The Great Chinese Revolution, 1800 through 1985, by John King Fairbank. Out of all this complex theory and custom by which the Chinese world was given an enduring and stable order, the most neglected aspect is the institution of foot binding. This custom arose at court in the 10th century during the late Tang and spread gradually among the upper class during the succeeding Song period. By the Ming and Qing eras after 1368, it had penetrated the mass of the Han Chinese population. It became so widespread that Western observers in the 19th century found it almost universal, not only among the upper classes, but throughout the farming population. Foot binding spread as a mark of gentrily and upper class status. Small feet became a prestige item to such an extent that a girl without them could not achieve a good marriage arrangement and was subjected to the disrespect and taunts of the community. In short, bound feet became de rigueur, the only right-thinking thing to do for a daughter, an obligation on the part of a mother who cared about her daughter's eventual marriage and success in life. The bound foot was a must. Only tribal peoples and exceptional groups like the Manju conquerors or the Hakka Chinese migrant groups in South China or finally the mean people, that lowest and rather small group who were below the social norms of chivalry that could avoid binding their daughter's feet. The small foot was called a golden lotus or a golden lily and was much celebrated in poems and essays by male enthusiasts. Here is the early Sung poet, Sung Tung Po, 1936 to 1101. Anointed with fragrance, she takes lotus steps. Though often sad, she steps with swift lightness. She dances like the wind, leaving no physical trace. Another stealthy but happily tries on the palace style. But few but feels such distress when she tries to walk. Look at them in the palms of your hands, so wondrously small that they defy description. Returning to Fairbank. The Sung philosophers stress women's inferiority as a basic element of the social order. The great Chu Hasi lived eight, uh, 1130 to 1200, codified the cosmology of China, as magisterially as his near-contemporary St. Thomas Aquinas, who died in 1274, codifying of that of Western Christendom. When he was a magistrate in the Fukin province, Chu Husi promoted foot-binding to preserve female chastity and a means of spreading Chinese culture and teaching the separation of men and women. By the Ming period, the overwhelming majority of Han Chinese women all over the country had artificially small feet. The Manchu emperors many times invaded against it in ordinary edicts, but to no avail. Male romanticizing on the subject continued unabated in this poem of the 14th century, caught by a gentle wind, her silk short ripples and waves, lotus blossoms in shoes most tight, as if she could stand on autumnal waters. Her shoe tips do not peek beyond the skirt, fearful lest the tiny embroideries be seen. There can be no doubt that foot binding was powered by a sexual fetish. Chinese love manuals are very specific about the use of bound feet as an arranger zone. All the different ways of taking hold of the foot, rubbing it with the hands, and using the mouth, tongue, and lips are explicitly catalogued. Many cases are recorded with the vestitude of high-class pornography. Meanwhile, the aesthetic attractiveness of the small shoes and their bright embroidered colors was praised in literature, while the tottering gait of foot-bound women was considered very fetching and as a symbol of feminine frailty which indeed it was. In fact, of course, bound feet were a guarantee of chastity because they kept women within the household and unable to venture far abroad. Lily feet, once formed, could not be unlocked like a chastity belt, 
By leaving only men able-bodied, they ensured male domination in a very concrete way. Thus the prevalence of foot-binding down to the 1920s, while the movement against it began only in the 1890s, vividly indexes the speed and scope of China's modern social revolution. This may be less comprehensible to white American males than to white women, or especially black Americans. For Chinese women within the present century have had an emancipation from venerable slavery. While foot binding is mentioned in so many foreign books about China, it is usually passed, way, uh, passed by as a curious detail. I don't think it was. It was a major erotic invention, still another achievement in Chinese social engineering. Girls painfully deform themselves throughout their adolescence in order to attract desirable husbands who, on their part, subscribe to a folklore of self-fulfilling beliefs. For example, that foot binding made a vagina more narrow and muscular than the lotus feet were major foci of erotic sensitivity. True androgynous zones, a net addition of 50% to the female equipment. Normal feet <clears throat> were, are now told by purveyors of sexual comfort, are an underdeveloped area essentially, but one must admit that they are a bit hard to handle where soft, small lotus feet could be grasped, rubbed, licked, sucked, nibbled, and bitten. The garless Jesuit father Ripa, who spent a decade at the court of Chang Shi in the early 1700s, reported that their taste is perverted to such an extraordinary degree that I knew a physician who lived with a woman with whom he had no other intercourse than that of viewing and fondling her feet. Having compacted all their nerve endings into a small era, area, golden lilies were far more sensitive than, for example, the back of the neck that used to bewitch Japanese samurai. After all, they had been created especially for male appreciation. When every proper girl did it, that bride would say that her sacrifice, suffering, and inconvenience were not worth it? A bride without small feet in the old China was like a new house in today's America without utilities. Who would want it? Consequently, in the 1930s and 40s, one still saw women on farms stumping around on their heels as they worked, victims of this old custom. A girl's foot was made small, preferably only three inches long, by pressing the four smaller toes under the sole or ball of the foot, planter, in order to make it narrower. At the same time, it was made shorter by forcing the big toe and heel closer together, so that the arch rose in a bowed shape. As a result, the arch was broken, and the foot could bear no weight except on the heel. If the process was begun at age five, the experience was less severe than that of a little girl, perhaps in a peasant household, had been left with normal feet until age eight or ten so that she could be more useful in the household. Here's a quote. When I was seven, said one woman to Ida Perdit, my mother washed and placed alm on my feet and cut the toenails. She then bent my toads towards the planter with a blind with a binding cloth ten feet long and two inches wide. Doing the right foot first and then the left, she ordered me to walk, but when I did, the small pain proved unbearable. That night, my feet felt on as if they were on fire, and I couldn't sleep. Mother struck me for crying. On the following day, I tried to hide, but was forced to walk on my feet. After several months, all my toes but the big one were pressed against the inner surface. Mother would remove the bindings and wipe the blood and pus which dripped from my feet. She told me that, the on that only with flesh removal could my feet become slender. Every two weeks I changed to new shoes. Each new pair was one to two tenths of an inch smaller than the previous one. In the summer my feet swelled offensively because of the blood and pus. In winter, my feet felt cold because of their lack of circulation. Four of the toes were curled, 
in like so many dead caterpillars. It took two years to achieve the three-inch model. My shanks were thin. My feet became humped, ugly, and odorous. Back to Fairbank. After the first two years, the pain lessened, but constricting the feet to a three-inch size was only the beginning of trouble. By this time, they were very private parts indeed and required daily care. Washing and manicuring at the same time, they had to be kept constantly bound and should day after day and night. Unmanicured nails could cut into the instep. Bindings could destroy circulation. Hot po blood poisoning or gangrene could result. Massage and applications of hot and cold water you were used to placate the discomfort. But walking on any distance remained difficult. It also produced corns on the bent under the toes, which had to be parred off with a knife. Once deformed to taste, bound feet were of little use to stand on, since weight was carried entirely upon the heels, had to be constantly shift back and forth. Since the bound foot lacked the resilience of a normal foot, it was tiring and uneasy to support someone who stood upon them. Foot binding, in short, had begun as an ostentatious luxury, which made a girl yes, less useful in family work and more dependent on help from others. Yet, once the custom had spread among the populace, lotus feet were considered an essential in order to get a good husband. Marriages, of course, were arranged between families and often by professional matchmakers in whose trade the length of a lily foot was rated more important than the beauty of the face or the body. When the anti-foot binding movement began at the end of the 19th century, many mothers and daughters, too, stubbornly clung to it to avoid the public shame of their children having large feet. The smallness of the foot, in short, was a source of social pride both to the family and to the victim, First and last, one must guess that at least a billion Chinese girls during the thousand-year currency of the social custom suffered the agony of foot-binding and reaped its rewards of pride and ecstasy, such as they were. Then there are three remarkable things about, for, about foot-binding. First, that it should be of, have been invented in the first place. It was such a feat of physio-psycho-sociological engineering. Second, that once invented, it should have spread so pervasively and lasted so long among a generally humane and practical-minded farming population. We are just at the beginning of understanding this phenomenon. The fact that an upper-class erotic luxury permeated the peasantry of old China, for whom it could only lower their productivity, productivity suggest that the old society was extraordinary, homely, extraordinarily homogeneous. Finally, it certainly was ingenious how men trapped women into mutilating themselves for an ostensibly sexual purpose and had the effect of perpetuating male domination. Brides left their own homes and entered their husband's family in the lowest servants, servants of their mothers-in-law. Husbands were chosen for them sight unseen, and might find romance and extramarital adventures, or, if they could afford it, bring in secondary wives. But a woman once betrothed, if her husband to be died even as a child, was expected to remain a chaste widow thereafter. Mao remarked that women hold up half the sky, but in the old China they were not supposed to lift their heads. The talent that one sees in Chinese women today had little chance to grow and express itself. This made a weak foundation for a modern society.